You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, God damn it! Get the point. Good. And now... Fendo. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Hey there, hi there, ho there, everybody, and happy Wacka 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 Doodle Wednesday. Yay, it's rocket chair time. And guess what? I am in the world that I know. It's my world, and I'm kind of opening up a little bit of a window for you to kind of peek in. But seriously, yeah, it's I, there's no way I can explain it because it's my world, and, and just the same for you. It's no way you can explain your world because it's yours. You can try. I might get a glimpse of some of it, but for the most part, yeah, we all have our own little worlds, and we kind of share them, and they intermingle, but mm, we just got to learn to play nice together. Yeah, that's pretty much the way it works, isn't it? That uh, doesn't happen very often, but hey, you know, we got to try. Ooh, the weather looks downright balmy in Grimmy land. Let me check and see what the weather's like in my world, other than it was kind of sort of when I came back home from in town cleaning my uncles um i had freezing fog on the way home so yeah it doesn't look yeah and look it says fog yay (laughs) oh joy oh bliss and i have two doggies on the floor over here by me i have a kitty cat on my lap i have pineapple juice right close by in case i get that tickle going on and i also have coffee woo woo here we go hey beetle thanks hun okay let me say hey to everybody um oh thanks grimmy yeah i'm the voice is coming back but yeah it's still i'm still not up to typical gram (laughs) if there is such a thing in any case over here on twitter thank you barman for tweeting me out i truly do appreciate it also hey there jj's i see you over here on twitter as well how are you doing darling and yeah just got reminded by the little rlm thing that popped up i'm coming to you from reallibertymedia.com channel 10 in case you don't know where you're listening You can also listen in on the Spreaker channel as well as um, RLM Internet Radio Station, RLM TuneIn Radio Station, um, let's see, RLMRadio.xyz, all kinds of RLM num places. So yeah, and if you are listening on any of those other places, please come on over to reallibertymedia.com. Think of a nickname, join the chat, give me some static, I'll give it back because seriously, I have crap internet. I know I say that every week, but every week it's still the same. It's still true. It's not exact, you know, tin can, kite string, and duct tape. Redneck. There you go. Okay. Hey there, Miss Kate. (laughs) Woo-woo! Well, actually, the coffee's on one side, pineapple juice is on the other. Coffee is for when I'm feeling a little bit on the thirsty side, but if I start feeling that tickle going on, I grab the pineapple juice. I know it doesn't make much sense, but between the two, I hope to be able to make it through. So, let's see. Chit-chatting with (laughs) people in the chit-chat, don't you know? So, let's see. Okay, I've said hey to Twitter. (coughs) Excuse me. Excuse me. Over here on realliberty.org. Yay, Rob works for sharing the being mean to statists. You know, sometimes people just need to get a verbal butt kicking. You know, because sometimes that's all they understand. Is if you get in their face and say, wait a minute here. You know, I don't know if I need to offer you a Tic Tac or toilet paper. One way or t'other, what's coming out of you ain't smelling real good. So you need to cut that crap out, you know, or pull your head out of your backside because you keep it up there that long and someone's going to volunteer you for a Pella Belly because you won't be able to see unless you got a window in your belly. Just saying. So, okay, once again, over here on realliberty.org, I see Rob Works, I see Cowboy Tech, I also see Bobby Bain and Grimner. (laughs) 
uh, Rob Renner or Bob Renner was over here a little while ago as well as a whole bunch of other people. Hi, Gary L. and Mary B. and Flasher and <coughs> excuse me, I may just have to um, get another sip of pineapple juice here pretty quick. I know, rascal, I know. She likes having her ears milked. And those of you that have kitty cats, you know what I mean. You know, rubbing the ears. She 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 put it's like she puts her wings out. She's ready to take off. Crazy kitty, but she just absolutely loves it. And she puts her paws on either side of my chin, and every once in a while the claws come out, and it's like it looks like I cut myself shaving. <laughs> goofy kitty cat, anyway. Yeah, well, I guess she fits with her goofy mom, huh? Okay, over here on Fakie Book, I did post it over in. The <coughs> Excuse me, the Real Liberty page over here on Fakie Book. Um, don't know if anybody liked it. Doesn't I don't have any notifications. But my brother just posted something. This just in. Viagra shipment stolen. Cops are looking for a gang of hardened criminals. But um boom boom. You know, sometimes you just gotta do dork. Oh, that's Flash's job. That's right. Flash is the dork. Dork table. He's the dork king. Over here on Mines. Hey there. Over here on Mines. How are y'all doing? Um, all kind of fun stuff going on over here. Although, I'm sure Grimmy probably shared it and let everybody know. Oh, jerky is perky. Yes, I do like beef jerky. Yes, I do. Mm. Speaking of food, I have pork chops going in the oven right now. Smothered pork chops and cream of mushroom sauce. Mm. And I'm going to have to make some egg noodles to go along with it later. But yeah, that's what I got waiting for me when I get done on the radio. Nom, 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 nom. That and to go and stir my laundry soap again. Because yeah, I had to make a new batch. Just what you wanted to know, isn't it? Okay, over here on this effing site, the wonderful Freedoms Network. <laughs> Excuse me, again, darn it, gonna need to break out the pineapple juice, that's all I got to say. I see Cowboy Tech has been sharing wonderful things over here, and Grimmy's over here as well. Thank you, Grimmy, for letting everybody know that I am live and in poison. And KD Troxel was here for a while as well as Loki Luck 3, so hey there, hi there, ho there, all of you. And the lovely Estrella as well, McJesus, McJesus, thank you baby McJesus, oh my lord. Mick Jesus. Oi. Oi. You know, some of the videos that I've been watching lately on alternate history, history, not necessarily alternate history, but a history that has been erased or all but erased and replaced with something that was more palatable though for the uh, leeches that be and in order to get the herd to go in the direction that they wanted them to go and wow I had all kind of fun little things pop into my head while watching and listening to a lot of these videos and and if I have time after I do the little article that I pulled up for this evening I may kind of give you some of those thoughts but <coughs> till then pineapple pineapple mm. I know rascal I know you're ever so helpful not not okay so where else do I need to go I think I need to go to the chat because that's where you need to be if you want to give me some static Jesus Cristo hey you know that uh, Christ or yeah Christ actually means Greece or oil it really does in ancient Greek if you believe that ancient Greek is really ancient Greek and not something that, um, you know, was made up in order to get us to follow along. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that it's a very, very deep hole. Hey, that's what I have too, Beetle. <coughs> Dole 100% pineapple juice. Num, 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 num. Ever so good for you. Okay, rascal, that's enough. So, over here in the RLM chat, right up top I see Barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world, closely followed by Cowboy Tech, who is sharing some awesome Larkin Rose. Thank you once again, Cowboy Tech, for that one. I've shared it multiple places, and I'm sure when I get done, I will share it a few more. Um, I also see Grimner, the RLM god, is here, as well as the lovely Moose Coil. How's your new job going, hun? <coughs> okay. Dang it! Stop that. 
See, sometimes I have to tell myself to quit that. And sometimes I listen and sometimes I don't. You know, I'm like a teenager like that. I also see the lovely Kate is here. Hey, Kate, how's things in your world? And looky there, DC is here. Hi, DC. Anti is also here as well as Asmo, Captain Asmo. The lovely Chloe is also in the chat as well as Chalcedonian. Looky there, Chloe's got a twin going on. Is this your evil twin, Chloe? Just checking because when there's two of me, one of them's an evil twin. Um... Yes, that's true. <laughs> I know. Hey, Van Meter, I hadn't even really thought of that. You know what? Oh, no, I made sure, Beetle, this is 100%. I read labels. I, it pisses my mother off. That's why she doesn't go grocery shopping with me, because I stop and read labels. So if it has anything even remotely, like I can't pronounce it, then it goes back on the shelf. Okay, back to saying hi. Um, yeah, we should we should bill Dole pineapple juice people because <coughs> because we're doing promos for them. <coughs> Excuse me, damn it, damn it. Where was I at? I'm here, kind of sorta. I be Don C is also here as well as double dose of pox. Ooh, triple dose because I see one farther down. Poxified and poxophone. We also see the lovely rain in the chat as well as RLM fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel. Rob Oikes is here and he fired up the bubbler earlier. I seen it. I seen it. Sorry, can't partake. I'm already having issues. But y'all just go right ahead. I'll get the second hand partaken. Um, Rome's is here. You know, when in Rome's, do as the Romans do. What did them Romans do? They ran around in bath towels all the time. Or sheets. It's your preference. You know, if you have those really big bath towels, those work as a toga for me because I'm a little person. Um, Vinny is here. Hi, Vinny. As well as Woodman. <laughs> Hey, Woody. <coughs> Damn it. I'm going to be doing that a lot tonight. I have a funny feeling. I also see Phantom is here as well as Beetle. Beetle, Beetle, Beetle. I hope you're having a glass of pineapple juice. It really is quite tasty. Um, cyborg Noodle. May you be touched by the Cyborgian noodliness. I also see Dakota and Frumpy, both from the Great White Nort. And it's a little bit on the white and cold side out here in Grammyland, too. And looky there, we got some grommet going on in the chat, as well as Java, 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 Java Doctor, too. And JJ's my Scottish feller. Honey, don't let the wind blow up the kilt, because this time of year, that's a little on the Bursey side. You want to keep them jewels warm, darling. Just saying. I also see Kozu is in the house as well as Moy, 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 Moy. And Ninsan Dubois. I don't know why I love that name so much, but I do love saying that name. Ninsan Dubois. Oh, you have to read the labels of everything? Oh, yeah. Ooh. I have a son-in-law that's that has garlic issues. <coughs> excuse me as well so yeah <clears throat> I understand that reading as a matter of fact that's how come I got a great big roast from my daughter <laughs> because she got it from work she works for JBS um, which is a company based out of Brazil I think yeah they purchased uh, Cargill's pork division and she went with JBS and actually much happier but um, in any case, she got this great big roast, beef roast. But in the ingredient or in the seasonings, it has garlic. And so she couldn't prepare it because her husband and one of her children have issues with garlic. And so when, last time I was out for a visit, she said, Mom, would you like this? And I went, <laughs> twist my arm. <laughs> I haven't fixed it yet because I need to have quite a few people because it's big old honker. I don't. I may have to get one of them big ass roaster thingies to cook it. It's huge. Huge, I tell you. In any case, back to saying hi. I get so distracted. Vinny, I almost said that other word, but I saw that you were in the chat and active, and I thought, nope, uh, nope, I'm going to make him wait for it. <laughs> I also see Poxa Home is here, as well as Papa Papa Pond Sauce, and looky there, Skittle, the former F Bominator, and to round out the crew, the one, the only, the Van Meter. Hey Donna, how you doing? Yeah, there are some bastards in this world that mess with P 
people when it comes to things that you are purchasing. I saw something earlier today about, um, I think it was um, Homestead Honey or something like that over on Twitter that shared something about um, fluoride. And it had this great big all the way down the label all of the different things that it's a poison and the things that you need to avoid doing and what you need to do if you don't avoid doing <laughs> those things that they said to avoid doing and then at the very bottom it says to put into the water supply system how much you should put in there and I thought you guys got nine tenths of the label you're saying how bad juju this crap is and then you give directions on how to put it into the water table like, because it, it makes your teeth strong, <laughs> which is bullshit, too. But, ooh, there was, a, there was a bad word that fell out. But, you know, it kind of happens when you're <clears throat> talking about that kind of nonsense. So, ooh, oh, ow, ooh, sorry, Jabberwocky, that sounds painful. Ouch. Okay. Moving along. So now that I've said, hey there, hi there, ho there, or have I said, hey there, I haven't said, hey there, hi there, ho there to the red pill people, have I? Uh, government slaves, yes. Charges $8,000 to fill your veins with young blood, now claims to be up and running. Keith Richards has been doing that forever. I think he goes to Switzerland, and... <laughs> I see that, Vinny. Um, I think Keith goes to Switzerland to have a, a complete... You know, it's like he gets his oil changed, only it's blood. <coughs> it's weird. In any case, over here, <coughs> excuse me, in the red pill, I also see Apostle is over here, as well as F. Canella and Juana Taco and KD Troxel and QFTW and Soily among those that are you know, and those are the ones that are not over in the RLM chitty chat, chitty chat, chitty chat. Where does the old blood go? God only knows, Beetle. I don't want to know. Seriously, if it was Keith Richards' old blood, I don't, I think that would be considered hazardous waste myself. But, okay, back to the article I wanted to get to today. It's really um, like an op-ed thing. It's from theguardian.com. Want to transform your life? Stop chasing perfection. So give up the rat race, accept reality, and have the courage to be disliked. It's the latest self-help trend and is not about self-reinvention, -re but finding contentment in the life you have. And it's by Oliver Berkman. So by tradition, this is the season for personal reinvention. But these days, it's hard to feel cynical about the idea of a triumphant liberation from the past. In the news, Brexit provides an hourly reminder that merely wishing to bring about a glorious fresh start is no guarantee that calamity won't be the result. Ah, those unintended consequences. Meanwhile, other dark developments, from the erosion of American democracy and the resurgence of the European far right, all the way to climate change, fuel a sense of foreboding that isn't exactly motivational when it comes to self-improvement. You know, the creeping fear that you might be living in the end times is a poor basis for making a new beginning. Well, you know, every time there's an ending, there's always a beginning. Endings always precede beginnings. It's just kind of the way things work. Now, at least in my little world. In any case, the never-ending debate on nature versus nurture seems to be drifting toward a gloomy acceptance that there's much about ourselves that will never change. <coughs> DNA isn't all that matters, writes the geneticist Robert Plomman, whose book Blueprint epitomized this mood last year. But it matters more than everything else put together in terms of the stable psychological traits that make us who we are. Really? Hmm. Then again, the self-reinvention narrative was always a bit suspect to begin with. For one thing, 
It's by no means clear that it's possible to transform yourself through the simple application of individual willpower. There's a lot of people out there, this is my opinion, that have an awful lot of won't power. I won't do that. I can't. I won't. It's the willpower that's a tough one. However, wherever you come down on the nature versus nurture, it's undeniable that we owe much of our success or failure in life to our circumstances and to luck. Then there is the infuriating psychological quirk of hedonic adaptation. <coughs> is that hedonic or hedonic? I have no idea. Otherwise known as the happiness treadmill. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. That really sucks when you're a T-Rex and your hands don't come together, don't you know? So, you can succeed in improving your life and the improvement will soon become part of the backdrop of your days and thus cease delivering pleasure to recover that sense of vitality and zest you'll have to reinvent yourself again ad infinitum well or ad infinitum however you wish to pronounce that yeah you know self-improvement is an ongoing battle it really is. Every day, I find something that I think, you know, I could probably do that a little bit better if I tried. <coughs> like being obnoxious. There are times when I think I could be a lot better at being obnoxious. And I'm just not in the mood for it. So, to go on with this, finally, there's a conundrum that the self being reinvented is the same one that's doing the reinventing. So your existing flaws invariably get baked into your vision of the future. And if you yearn to become, say, uh, more productive or more empathic or physically fit in 2019, how do you know that that very yearning isn't just another expression of your tendency to beat yourself up, which you'd be better off addressing than indulging, which, yeah, you beat yourself up because I'm just not fit. I'm just not this. I'm just not that. I'm going to work on. That is a form of beating yourself up. Or suppose you plan to conquer your perfectionism. How will you avoid getting all perfectionistic about it? Yeah, that is kind of a conundrum, isn't it? There are no completely fresh starts. There is no year zero. And you're already hopelessly ensnared in the only life you'll ever get unless you believe in reincarnation. And then you get to carry Carmen, karma along with you. <coughs> Not Carmen, because she's got a fruit basket on her head. <clears throat> Moving along. So, in response to the prevailing mood, there has been a noticeable change of tone in the world of self-help. It's a publishing genre historically dedicated to promising massive, near effortless transformation overnight or in a couple of weeks at most. So for a while now, that hyperbole has been losing ground to, this, to a spirit of anti-utopianism, of accepting yourself as you are, building a good enough life. <coughs> Excuse me, or just project protecting yourself from the worst of the world outside. Now, adult coloring books are the most easily mockable manifestation of this urge, which I do like the adult coloring books. I gave my kids coloring books a couple years ago for Christmas, grandkids and my kids, and uh, the kids, <coughs> excuse me, got adult ones, as in, you know, obnoxious joke ones. <laughs> my youngest daughter really, really liked hers. She would color pages and then take them to wor work and hang them up on her office wall. She's, she get, comes by it honestly, just saying. So, it is detectable too in the unceasing <coughs> excuse me, stream of Scandinavian lifestyle concepts of hygiene, I have no, or logum, logum, 
and the rest, which is uh, with their focus on hunkering down and getting cozy, and in the ongoing rediscovery of Stoic philosophy and the championing of resilience as techniques for enduring life's blows. Which, yeah, every time life kicks me somewhere that it shouldn't kick me and puts me down in the dirt, a lot of times I come up coughing, hacking, spewing, but I do get back up again. And I look life in the eye and I go, that was not fun. I will not put myself there again. (coughs) (coughs) Vinny, I did it, didn't I? And I didn't even notice. Dang it. Okay. To carry on with this, it's everywhere present this time around in the fa- in the phase of the publishing calendar irritatingly known as New Year New You. Oh my god, I would not <laughs> I would not want that. Yeah, I know. I'm only going to be doing a- an hour tonight cuz yeah, this is not fun. Darn tickle and my pineapple juice is just going, okay, we'll we'll deal with it for a few minutes. I don't throughout the day I don't talk this much so I need to get myself back in the flow apparently so one thought-provoking example of the new edition is to solve for happy by uh, Mo Gaudat who is formerly a senior executive of Google X the search giants secretive research and development arm generally speaking the notion that happiness is an engineering problem is one to distrust but Gaudat Far from championing the tech multimillionaire lifestyle as the only one worth aiming for, writes movingly of having achieved it only to discover its emptiness. And he has endured far worse, losing his 21-year-old son, Ali, to the results of complications during routine surgery. Routine surgery. You know, they always say it's routine surgery. Routine surgery. Is it routine for you? You know, the one being cut up on? Maybe routine for them, but not for you. (coughs) Excuse me. So, I think I'm going to break down and do one of my on-guard throat lozenges. and See if maybe that doesn't help. Just a wee bit. I got got all kind of things going on here today. Just backup plans like crazy. Okay. So, at the core of Gadot's formula for happiness is the venerable observation that happiness equals reality minus expectations. Wow, that wow, that really is true. And in order to feel distress because your life is lacking something, you must first have had some expectation of ob- attaining that thing. So, you know, my life lacks a 70-foot yacht, but this causes me no suffering because I never imagined I'd have one. There you go. Now, the argument is not, as progressive critics of self-help sometimes imagine, that disadvantaged people need only stop expecting anything better in order to be content. Some expectations, a reasonable standard of living, health care, Fulfilling work and social connection may be entirely rational. But seeing the truth of the formula acts as a kind of sieve, allowing you to separate the handful of things that you genuinely want from life from those that you've been socialized into believing you should want. You know, that whole keeping up with the Joneses thing. Now, the latter aren't worth the pursuit. And if they are, the reason you're trying to invent a new you, you're better off sticking with the old one. Now, one of the most rigorous articulations of the new mood of acceptance is happy ever after escaping the myth of the perfect life by Paul Dolan, who's a professor of behavioral sciences at LSE. And the publicity material explains that it's an internationally renowned expert in human behavior and happiness. An expert, a former drip under pressure. All righty then. Now his book is a persuasive demolition of many of our cultural stories about how we ought to live, including the idea that there's anything particularly desirable about being a senior academic or a renowned expert. 
In fact, his data suggests that pursuing education beyond the age of 18 is unlikely to make much positive difference in the pleasure or sense of purpose that you experience in life. On average, after secondary school, happiness decreases as education increases. Look at all those kids on college campuses these days that have to have frickin' safe rooms. They do not look happy to me. Now, as Dolan concedes, it can be notoriously hard to pin down the direction of causation in well-being research. It could be that gloomier people are more prone to doing university degrees, rather than that degrees make people gloomy. Although I would think the thought of all of that student debt would make someone extremely gloomy and glum. Yet, either way, the belief that more education equals more fulfillment is a clear example of what he calls a narrative trap. It's a socially imposed message about the ideal life that doesn't match real experience. This ideal often ends up doing more harm than good either by propelling people into lives that they don't enjoy or by wrongly convincing those who don't make the grade that they're missing out on a more satisfying experience. Oh, but if you only coulda, woulda, shoulda. Yeah, armchair quarterbacking never makes anybody happier. Really doesn't. Now, another trap is the belief that higher status jobs reliably bring more satisfaction. In fact, florists are generally much happier than lawyers. Or that a larger income necessarily buys more happiness. It does, but only up to about 50,000 pound a year, which I think would probably equate to close to $75,000. <coughs> Excuse me, somewhere in that range. 75 to 80. Now, beyond that, tasks related to earning more money squeeze out more enjoyable ones. I can understand that because you have more pressure to compete, to perform, all that other fun stuff. I actually got offered a job the other day uh, being a general manager at a local motel, and I went, uh, no, thank you. I've been a boss before, and I am of an age where I no longer want to be a boss applesauce. So, I said, thank you, no. There's no way you could pay me enough to do, to be a boss anymore. Because it just plain, it ain't worth it. It just ain't worth it. I'll, I'll be my own boss. That works for me. Oh, and as for the florist thing, you know, that does make sense to me. Because they're dealing with plants all day long. Plants make you happy. Or at least they make me happy. I would be happy. So, wait, I already am. Never mind. Moving along. So, these sort of findings are increasingly well known, but where Dolan excels is in drawing attention to how stubbornly we resist their implications. <coughs> so, if happiness is a sense of purpose, um, oh, if happiness and a sense of purpose are your goals in life, then a good job or education or salary that fails to deliver them isn't really good in any meaningful sense of the word. <clears throat> Which makes it a strange thing to strive for, or to encourage your children to strive for. Oh, and speaking of children, the evidence is that parenthood won't make you happier either. It does boost people's sense of purpose, Although apparently not more than various other things. And I think you really have to be, you know, I, I look around at a lot of people that, that said, I don't want kids and they never had kids. And I look at them and I watch their lifestyle and I've known them for years and years and years. And I think mm, it's a good thing you decided not to go forth and, procre and reproduce. It really is. Bec mm, yeah. But I'm also seeing them through my perspective, and I'm also seeing them uh, from the vantage point of them never having children. So, you know, lots of variables in that. Now, to carry on with this, <clears throat> likewise, a dedicated pursuit of physical fitness, which turns out to lead us less happiness than you'd think. And marriage 
It's true that married people tell researchers that they're happier than when they were single. But if their husband and wife is present in the room, <coughs> excuse me, only, <coughs> darn it. That's only if the husband or wife is present in the room during the interview. So if they're interviewed one-on-one, -on -one, like the spouse is out of the room, things ain't quite so rosy as, as, yeah. Now, what makes happy ever after somewhat radical, at least by the standards of popular psychology, is its recognition that these narrative traps aren't simply inexplic or inexplicable mistakes that we happen to make, but the products of ideology. They may not serve us, but they certainly serve the system in which we find ourselves embedded. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, the pursuit of wealth or social mobility might not bring happiness, but it does fuel economic growth. While marriage, parenthood, fitness, and the rest, <coughs> excuse me, keep the whole operation running smoothly into the next generation. Dolan focuses on how uniquely detrimental such messages can be for children from working class families. families. Now the stereotypes about appropriate accents and lifestyles may deter them from going to university at all. And those who make it into middle-class professions then face self-consciousness and insecurity about fitting in. Dolan, raised lower working class in East London, writes that he still struggles with the cultural codes of academia. I weigh, tra I weight train with bodybuilders. Seeing a blazer or a pair of loafers at a bodybuilding competition is as rare as rocking horse shite. Which, yeah, I can imagine that would be true. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, a new crop of anti-perfectionist self-help books are an important counterweight to the conventional message of self-reinvention, which is that there's no point at which it makes sense to be satisfied with your situation and finally relax. Since you could always benefit from acquiring more money or status or education and so on and so on and so on, etc., etc., etc. So what's less clear is whether this humbler kind of advice is an easier, there you go, Vinny, to implement on a uh, practical level or than an old sort. So apart from anything else, our narratives about the perfect life aren't just beliefs that we can choose to jettison by a mere act of will after reading about research that refutes them. They're deeply entrenched in the culture, reinforced by the media, inculcated in us as small children, not to mention in our genes. And there are some obvious evolutionary advantages to constantly craving more resources and never feeling as if you've got what you've got is sufficient. Hmm. Moreover, no research findings about the average happiness of the general population can decisively prove that a given lifestyle choice is the right or wrong one for you, with all of your idiosyncrasies. Now, one chapter in Happy Ever After gamely makes a case for polyamorous relationships as a path to increased happiness. <laughs> really? But whatever your reaction to that prospect, thrilling erotic adventure or indescribable hassle, it's not clear that you should try to override it based on the results of academic studies. Basically, what he just said there is, if it gives you a not-so-funny feeling inside or makes your tummy kind of nod up a little bit, then just because some quackademic in the ivory towers of education did a study and said, you know, this might bring you more happiness, there's that wonderful word in there, might. So, you know, if it doesn't sound appealing to you, then the heck with all of their studies. Because it doesn't sound appealing to you. And if it does, well, then there you go. You got a little justification for what sounds appealing to you. 
different strokes for different folks. Now, there's another more mind-bending problem with using this kind of research to direct personal change, which is that many such transitions are what the philosopher L.A. Paul calls transformative experiences. They turn you into a person so different that you're unable, from the vantage point of the present, to imagine what that future person will make of them. So, to pick the most obvious example, becoming a parent might transform you into the kind of person who endures having children, even if beforehand you weren't. But it might just as easily work the other way, turning someone enthusiastic about the prospect um, into the kind who would never have chosen to do so. You know, I used to think I wanted to have loads and loads and loads of kids just like my mom did until I had kids. And then I realized this would not be a good thing. Two is plenty. Two and a spouse is more than I could handle. Now, to carry on with this, nonetheless, it's psychologically freeing to be reminded that there is no single path to satisfaction. Ding, 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 ding. And that if circumstances or personal preferences disbar you from following the herd, you still have a good shot at fulfillment. In other words, you can do your own thing and still find happiness. It's just preferable if when you're doing your own thing, you ain't and cause an intentional harm to another. It's preferable. Now, quite a lot of what passes itself off as dialogue about our society, the essayist Kim or Tim Creeder has written, consists of people trying to justify their choices as the only right or natural ones by denouncing others as selfish or pathological or wrong. So it's easy to overlook that hidden behind all the smug certainty is a poignant insecurity and the naked 3 a.m. terror of regret. Much of the time, when it comes to building a meaningful life, you're flying blind. But the comforting truth is that so is everyone else. And no, I'm not talking, what is that? birdcage or whatever the hell that new movie is on Netflix. I've seen advertisements for it. No desire to see it. To carry on with this. Then again, judging by its continued dominance of the self-help shelves, you'd be forgiven for concluding that the key to a perfect life was indisputable. Lots and lots of Buddhists, or at least Buddhist-inspired meditation... And this is ironic since Buddhism embo embodies one of the er earliest confrontations with the truth about the perfectionist standards by which we judge the world and ourselves. That this is a recipe for permanent dissatisfaction. Now the basic situation, Buddha famously said, is that life is suffering. Everything is impermanent. Old age, sickness, and death are our inescapable human fate. And your philosophy of happiness had better acknowledge these realities. Otherwise, the only possible result is even more suffering for you and everyone around you. Because trust me, when you're around a miserable person, do they not kind of sort of it gets stuck on you? And you start getting the miserable stuff going too, which is why I try to steer clear of miserable people. So, <clears throat> while he probably wouldn't put it so bluntly, this is the spirit that imbues a new work by South Korean Zen writer and former monk, Hyman Sunman. Love for imperfect things, how to be kind and forgiving toward yourself and others. Now, in this snark-saturated times, it's cheering that a voice is as quietly friendly as his can make you a mega-celebrity. He has a combined social media following of around 2 million people, plus a previous global bestseller, The Things That You Can See Only When You Slow Down. <clears throat> In Seoul, where he lives, he presides over a Zen-infused therapy center, <coughs> the School for Broken Hearts, 
Oh, <coughs> excuse me. Now, Hyman is especially eloquent on sm on life's smaller dis dissatisfactions and how they can sometimes be trickier to deal with than the bigger, more dramatic ones, which, yeah, it is the little things. For example, though it's a good thing that we talk so much more openly today about mental illness, one perverse consequence is that it can actually be easier to admit to a serious depression than to a milder, pervasive sense of disappointment in life. Unlike other emotions, disappointment is very tricky to express. It comes out as petty and small-minded. And it also tends to sound like you're blaming other people for failing to measure up. Yet, of course, it's a far more widespread problem than severe suffering. And it has been argued that Buddha's observation that life is suffering might be more accurately translated as something like, life is bothersome. Oh, Winnie the Pooh would like that. <coughs> and with luck, extreme agony will be very infrequent in your life, but a background sense of things being not quite mo right may be truly close to universal. And that's why I've done a lot of video watching lately. Things just ain't quite right. Now, the first step towards relieving this kind of discontent, Hyman suggests, is to recognize the untenability of the demand that you or anyone you encounter should demonstrate perfection to begin with. Much of the bothersomeness of daily life arises not from circumstances themselves, but from the insistence that they ought to be other than they are. Almost sounds like an Alice in Wonderland kind of thing. And what would be, wouldn't be, you see? Now, having not attained Hyman's tolerance for other people's flaws, I can't resist observing that his wisdom all too often comes across as platitudinous. Platitudinous. That's kind of a fun word. And the book's prose passages are interspersed with sections laid out in blank verse, inadvertently demonstrating that mundane reflections aren't transformed into profundities merely by centering them on the page and inserting a few line breaks. And an example of this is, if someone did not ask for your help, do not try to solve her problem for her. Though your intentions may be good, you risk taking control away from her and injuring her self-esteem, which to me makes a whole hell of a lot of sense. He's not wrong. And behind the sporadic b banality lurks the bracingly hard-headed world view. Reality is what it is. And a lot of unnecessary misery arises from demanding that things shouldn't be the way that, as a matter of stubborn fact, they are. Now, this is not a counsel of resignation. Having accepted the reality of your situation, it may well be appropriate to try to change it. But not denying how things stand is the essential first step. Or, as psychotherapist Carl Rogers put it, the pur curious paradox is that when I accept myself just as I am, then I can change. Ironically, if not very surprisingly, the well-being industry has proved or yeah, proved adept at turning this new spirit of modesty and acceptance into another expensive consumerist pursuit. Those secrets of happiness are a case in point. <clears throat> Hygge, which is H-Y-G-G-E, circle, I know you're going to laugh at me at the way I pronounced it, but that's okay. It may evoke contented relaxation around a familiar fireplace with old friends, but that doesn't mean you can't spend almost 200 pounds on a specially Hygge appropriate plant dyed pillow. Really? I would never spend that kind of money on a pillow. Never. Or 80 pounds on a set of candle holders. N once again, no. I, I got other things I would spend that kind of money on. 
Now, um, your effort to become the sort of person who finds happiness in what they already have can easily become its own interminable quest in which success and therefore happiness always lies in some fantasy of the future rather than in the here and now. As always, this is capitalism's fault, but most of us are complicit. We chase unattainable fantasies of self-reinvention rather than confronting reality, at least in part because life is easier that way. This is one of the lessons of an absorbing recent addition to the anti-perfectionist self-help subgenre, The Courage to be Disliked, by Ichiro Kishimi and Fumitak Koga. I'm sure I buggered that one up. Published in English last year. Now, despite all the new Japanese phenomena marketing, the book was described by one critic as Mario Kondo, but for your brain. Or Marie Kondo, whoever that is. And it's primarily an accessible exploration of the work of the Austrian psychotherapist Alfred Adler. He held that frequently cling, uh, we frequently cling to our problems, no matter how much we complain about them, and claim that we want to eradicate them, because overcoming them necessitates an encounter with fear. Yeah, so long as you, that known problem, that one that you've got right there that you can bitch about all the time, yeah, that's a known one. Once you confront it, once you deal with it, once you move past it, now you're into the unknown again because there's something else that you don't know about that's different. <coughs> yeah. Now, it can be easier to locate fulfillment and fulfillment in intimate relationships above all in the future where we never quite have to do what it takes to attain it rather than run the interpersonal risks involved in trying to achieve it now. The problem as Kashimi and Koka make clear is that this only makes for more suffering in the present. By systematically biasing you towards taking the kind of actions that postpone rather than build a meaningful life. Now in this way, fantasies of total self-transformation don't simply fail, they also block change of the more modest but real kind. And in any case, the future never seems to arrive. The truth is that the present is the only time it'll ever be possible to make a change. All you have is here. All you have is now. Transformative self-reinvention may be an over-optimistic dream, but defeatism about change is its own kind of false comfort too. Both are forms of absolutism that serve to justify passivity. We will fail to reinvent ourselves this January or next month or next January, or ever. But once we finally get that fact into our heads, we might at least be able to start making a few improvements. We might. So I know that was rather long and rather windy, but the, the overall thing behind that for me was that there are so many people out there that, you know, if you don't think like I do, or why can't I have, or why isn't that person, or why don't they like me, or how come you know, this, or, you know, all this other fun stuff. If you're looking at things like, if I woulda, coulda, shoulda, and that's another part of that, all of these videos that I've been watching lately about false history and all this other fun stuff. <coughs> just, just acknowledging the fact that anybody that's listening to me right now knows that I truly believe, and a belief is basically a thought process that has become a habit. Um, I truly believe 
that everything we've been told is a lie. Now, some of the things may have a ring of truth to them, but they are based on previous lies. And if anything uses a previous lie as its foundation, it is still a lie. Even if they're telling you something that is factual, if the foundation for it, the basis for it is a lie, then it's all it's doing is expanding on that lie. That's all it's doing. Now I do have, it's it's getting close to an hour and I still want to get to the pig and I may, I may do, okay, it's, I'm not going to do a full two hours. I already know that because, but I do need to get to this date in history. So thank you for listening to that, that lovely little diatribe. Um, I rather enjoyed it. I found a lot of things in it that kind of sort of made me go, hmm, hmm. But, um, you know, there's an awful lot, because uh, I used to do an awful lot of that. I need to improve myself. I need to do this. I need to do that. And maybe, maybe I just need to learn to look in the mirror and go, that's me. That's me. Now, what can I do today that will make me a happier me? Help me feel a, like a happier me. Although I'm usually a happier me anyway. But, you know, just, just that first step of, being able to look in the mirror and go, yeah, I know that person. I kind of like that person. I've grown rather attached to them, if you will. And that's maybe what this is. You know, it's just getting you to realize that you are who you are. And the sooner that you adjust to that and go, okay, I am who I am, as Popeye would say, then you can move forward from there. It's kind of a freeing kind of thing because once you go, I am who I am, then you can, I am this today and tomorrow I'm that. And maybe the next day I will be something else. But I really don't know for sure because for right now, I am now. Live in the now. Live in the here. Worrying about tomorrow robs you of your happiness from here and now. Or that you could be having in the here and now. Living in the past does the same thing. Live in the here and now. Deal with what you can do right here, right now, right in front of you. That's the best advice I could give you. And it's pretty much advice my mother gave me. Only I didn't pay attention to it all them years ago. <laughs> Go figure, teenagers. In any case, over here on PIGazette.com, from Hambo and Porcus, omitory, what they, whatever that is, it denotes American history after it's been cleansed by progtards who expunge anything that forms the solid foundation upon which Reagan's shining, excuse me, shining city on the hill is built. Oh my goodness, you know history is written by the winners, or the whiners, as case may be, currently. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> history is not what, history is not what we have been taught. Let's just put it like that, okay? It's a his story kind of thing. In the quotable quotes section, this morning I was listening to a morning talk show and as is the case since his death, there's a lot of conversation about POTUS George H.W. Bush and Bill Bennett who served under GHWB was being interviewed. One of the questions that the commentator asked was, how would you compare George Herbert Walker Bush to Donald Trump? To which Dr. Bennett's response was rather brilliant, according to this person. Um, the world is an ever-changing place. Sometimes you need Mother Teresa, and sometimes you need Dirty Harry. And I just got to throw this out there just because I have done some research on Mother Teresa, and that woman wasn't as saintly as they want you to think she was. She was actually a rather mean individual. So I'm thinking Mother Teresa and Dirty Harry? Mm, both are fictional characters, and both of them would just as soon kick you in the balls as do something nice for you. That's from my personal perspective. Now, this date in history. <coughs> 
The 16th of January, 1920, one year after it was ratified, the 18th Amendment, Prohibition, takes effect. The nanny state's 13-year-long frontal assault on un- or inalienable individual liberty has begun. Oh, it started way before that, honey. It really did. This, <clears throat> excuse me, this date in history, the 16th of January, 1988, Jimmy the Greek Snyder thrills ethnocrats spitless by saying... The slave owner would breed his big black to his big woman so that he would have a big black kid. That's where it all started. Really? He said that? You guys are really digging for that one. That's all I gotta say. They got all kinds of other really, really inf um, informative stuff. Um... Tasty Tidbits has a little thing. The 10 Most Destructive Americans of My Eight Decades by Frank Hawkins that you might wish to read. <laughs> Ooh. I will just give you the names. Mark Felt, Bill Ayers, Teddy Kennedy, Walter Cronkite, Bill and Shrillery Clinton, Valerie Jarrett, Jimmy Carter, Lyndon Johnson, um... Barack Hussein, Dingleberry Obama, and John Kerry. So, hmm. Come on over to PIGazette.com. Say hey to Hambo and Porkus for me. And, uh, yeah, check out all of the fun stuff. They got all kinds of links all over the place. They also have a new uh, top story that you might want to get into as well. Um, let's see. What else is going on? Where else do I wish to go? Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. I think I probably will just go ahead and call it. Call it for the night. Because, yeah. My pineapple juice and my lozenge <coughs> are just kind of, sort of, kind of, sort of cutting it. So, y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on reallibertymedia.com, channel 10. Thank you for putting up with my hacking, wheezing, coughing, sneezing kind of crap tonight. And, um... I will not, once again, will not be here on Friday. I have an appointment that was scheduled way, way, way back yonder. Um, and I will not be back in town um, in time to do the rocket chair. So I will be back next week, Wednesday. In the interim, there's all kinds of awesome shows going on here on RLM. Vinny's got shows. Flash has got shows. Grammy's got shows. Um... Freaker's Ball is Friday night. The Dork Table is on Saturday. Uh, Grimmy doing the blues on Sunday. Hal Anthony going to open up a can of whoop-ass on yo ass on Sunday. All kinds of way cool stuff going on. So be sure to listen in because you never know what kind of brain food you're going to get. But in the meantime, I am going to go and uh, chow down on some pork chops and, and cream of mushroom num 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 numminess and uh, I guess I will catch up with you later please remember I truly do love you all and I wish you all enough good night <laughs>